Hi, and welcome to today's video, which will be about the infamous coin toss and geometric Brownian motion. This will be presented just by myself, so let's jump right in. I started working on ergodicity in economics just before Christmas in 2006. A few years later, in 2011, I was invited to explain what I had been doing in a 15-minute general audience talk at Goodenough College in London. That seemed quite daunting. <clears throat> explain to a lay audience ergodicity breaking and its relevance in economics. As a reminder, we call a randomly varying quantity ergodic if its expectation value and its long time average are the same. If that's not the case, then the quantity is not ergodic. After some pondering, I decided to motivate my work with a simple gamble. Bet some money, toss a coin, something happens. Games like this have a long history in probability theory and economics, and looking back, my coin toss gamble fits neatly into the development of these fields. Here's my gamble. Toss a fair coin. If it's heads, your wealth increases by 50%. If it's tails, your wealth decreases by 40%. Now repeat many times. We'll see immediately why this is interesting if we ask what happens to your wealth in this gamble on average. As we know, on average can have two important meanings. First, an average can be taken across many systems. That's the expected value or ensemble average. Second, an average can be taken in a single system over a long time, the time average. In my gamble, a system is the wealth of one person. The ergodicity question is, what is the relationship between what happens to the average wealth of many people and what happens to the wealth of one person averaged over time. In 1713, Nicholas Bernoulli said to Montmartre about a similar gamble, you will find something very curious. To be clear, we're not interested in differences in the averages that arise by chance. So we will toss so many coins, or toss one coin so many times, that the law of large numbers removes the randomness from the averages. Let's simulate to see what happens in this gamble. We start with one dollar and play for 10 rounds. Let's say that's 10 minutes in real time, where we toss the coin once per minute. I now build an ensemble of parallel systems, like different people playing this game tossing different coins. Here are three systems and their average, that's the red line. And here are 10 and 30. And now it gets a bit messy, so I'll stop plotting individual trajectories and just continue with the average. From 30, we go to 100, to 300, to 1,000, to 3,000, to 10,000. As the number of parallel systems becomes large, the average over the ensemble converges to the expected value. The result is as we might have guessed. The expected value increases exponentially as time passes, gaining 5% per round. It reflects the additivity of the expected value. 1.5 plus 0.6 divided by 2 is 1.05, a 5% gain. Now for the other average. We keep playing along one trajectory. For reference, I also plot the expected value. That's the ensemble average over an ensemble of infinitely many parallel systems. So let's play for an hour, for a day, a week, a month, a year. The result, decay. The individual trajectory tends to zero in the long run, losing about 5% per round. This reflects the multiplicativity of the dynamic we specified. 1.5 times 0.6 is 0.9, a 10% drop over two rounds, or roughly a 5% drop per round. Still, we could be led to believe that this was a particularly unlucky trajectory. But there's no evidence for that. It goes down very smoothly, and that's no fluke. We've now played for so long that time has removed any randomness in the slope of this line. We could try again and again and again. We would not find a trajectory that goes up over a year. Of course, some trajectories must go up for the expected value to go up. But they are so rare that even if we spent our lifetime simulating, we wouldn't find one. We really wouldn't. If everyone on Earth were to generate a billion trajectories every second and played for an entire lifetime, no one would find an upward trajectory. 
Not even if we assume that the same were done on all planets in the galaxy, assuming that all stars have planets, and so on. It's that level of improbable. If you want to write it down, the probability of a single trajectory breaking even over a year is 0 0.1500 zeros or so, and then something else. The mathematics here is about taking two different limits, or of taking limits in different orders, first one, then the other. In the first case, we took the limit of infinite ensemble size, and that shows growth. The reason it shows growth is that the innocent looking expected value, often denoted by capital E, or with angled brackets, implements an infinite ensemble, however unrealistic that is. In our case, it's very unrealistic. But this infinite ensemble includes the luckiest trajectories. And even though they're as rare as we just said, they're even luckier than they're rare. Their wealth increases so fast that it makes up for the stupendous decrease in their probability. In the second case, we took the limit of infinite playtime and that shows decay. So if we pick any fixed time and average over ever more systems, we will see growth. If we pick any trajectory and follow it, follow it for long enough, we will see decay. Two important things to keep in mind. First, the number of systems you need to average over in order to see growth grows exponentially with the number of rounds you play. In other words, however big your ensemble, you will quickly run out of systems and see decay. Second, imagine you're an individual playing this game. The growing expected value has no significance for you. You can't clone yourself and average over your clones. You only have precisely one system, which is called reality. But the long time behavior has significance. You may not live forever, but you live for longer than one minute. Let's recap. On average, we have either a gain of 5% per round or a loss of 5% per round, depending on what we mean by average. Because the type of average matters, we say wealth under the rules of this game is not ergodic. It's important to understand that we are talking about deterministic properties of this game. In the limit of infinitely many trajectories, the ensemble average increases deterministically at 5% per round. In any single trajectory, even in one that was very lucky early on, wealth drops by about 5% per round deterministically in the limit of infinitely long time. Let's pause here and let this sink in. Every trajectory decays if we wait long enough, and the average of all trajectories always wins if we average over enough trajectories. Imagine an economy where income behaves in this way. GDP would grow, but practically everyone's income would decline. Mathematically, it's very much possible for econ economies to operate in such a regime. Not just possible, it's quite likely for economies to do that. At least for a while, maybe for a few decades every now and then. What are the political implications? A government looking at GDP would think the economy is doing great, but pretty much no one out there on the street would share that impression. If such conditions persist for a long time, what happens to democracy? Now let's generalize. Of course we could choose different factors whereby wealth grows or shrinks when we toss the coin. For example, 2.5 for heads and 1 for tails. In that case, all trajectories grow but the expected value grows faster in the long run than any individual trajectory. We can tweak the original rules differently. The factors are again 1.5 and 0.6, but you are now allowed to withhold some of your wealth. You can choose to bet some fraction. Let's see what happens to the long-time growth rate as we tune that fraction from 0 to 1. If we invest 0%, of course nothing happens to our wealth. If we invest just a small fraction, we will gain in the long run. Not as fast as the expected value, but we're gaining. Investing one quarter of our wealth in each round is the best we can do. This optimal fraction is known as the Kelly fraction, or the time optimal leverage. If we invest more than that, our long-term returns get worse. And if we invest everything, we recover the result we already knew, losing about 5% per round. 
Now, why is this game so interesting? I've never been offered this game, so why does it matter? We'll come to that. Let's write x for wealth and see what happens over time in symbols. Wealth, sometime delta t in the future, is wealth right now at time t times a random factor rt. In each round, we multiply what's already there with a random factor. Sometimes we're luckier, sometimes we're not so lucky. C'est la vie. Literally. Because life can be defined as that which self-reproduces. And that is precisely what this equation describes, a quantity that grows in proportion to itself. Just like the number of rabbits on that hill, or the lilies in the pond, or the number of coronavirus infections in March 2020. C'est la vie. Of course, real growth has limits. The point is that this dynamic is at the root, at the very early stages, of the evolutionary dynamics of all living things, by definition. Of all self-reproducing things. And it even has that other element required for evolution, randomness. This simple equation is quite something. It's a very simple model of life, including by our very simple definition capital. Capitalism as an economic system is defined by allowing capital to produce more of itself through investment. Not surprisingly, another form of this equation is the most influential model in mathematical finance. That's the final point for this video. Let's move from the discrete Cointos equation to geometric Brownian motion. GBM is a stochastic differential equation. And if you have any mathematical intuition or common sense, stochastic differential equations will make you recoil in horror. But this one is worth the pain. It's the most important stochastic differential equation in the theory of finance, and important far beyond that. At LML, we affectionately call it the equation of life. Sometimes in mathematics, as in life, the easiest route ahead looks anything but easy at first. I think that's why mathematics often seems so inaccessible. Formal training presents us with mathematical facts that seem to have absolutely no use. And they really don't, not immediately anyway. But unless our teachers just want to see us suffer, the seemingly pointless facts they tell us about will eventually connect and come in very handy later on. It's the same with stochastic differential equations. Expressing something as nice and intuitive as the coin toss in terms of one of those incomprehensible objects seems masochistic. But the truth is, it's extremely useful. Because it allows us to use the tools of calculus, if we adjust them a bit. And calculus is a very powerful branch of mathematics. Powerful in describing physical reality. Because somewhere deep down, describing a thing in terms of calculus makes use of the belief that things have continuity in space and time. In this video, I won't go into all the details. I'll just motivate in what sense the coin toss and geometric Brownian motion are really the same thing expressed in slightly different terms. The main point is to dispel the fear you might have of stochastic differential equations. They only really mean something when interpreted in discrete terms, like the coin toss game. That's the secret. By themselves, they're really they're just a shorthand notation that makes it easy to use tricks that were made for continuous processes, calculus. Differential equations are written in terms of differences. So let's rewrite the Cointos equation in terms of the difference between wealth at time t plus delta t and wealth at time t. Delta x is equal to x of t plus delta t minus x of t, which is x of t times rt minus x of t, and that is also x of t times rt minus 1. We can now express the random factor rt as a sum of a deterministic part and a random part that's symmetric. We would write this as rt is 1 plus mu tilde plus sigma tilde. And with that, our equation becomes delta x is x times mu tilde plus sigma tilde. From here, it's only a small step to arrive at geometric Brownian motion. We've already got a change in x that's proportional to x itself, expressed as the sum of a deterministic part and a random symmetric part. To get to something continuous in time, we have to think about changes that happen on a short time scale. It's the only way 
to connect to something that changes always, like in calculus, not just at the discrete intervals that mark the toss of the coin. So let's think of delta t as a general small time difference between observations of x of t. How would changes in x scale with such changes in time? The deterministic part is easy. It would scale in proportion to elapsed time. The random part of the wealth change would scale as the square root of elapsed time. By this we mean that the envelope of the random part, for example, some quantile of this random part, would be proportional to the square root of delta t. This square root is a fundamental scaling property of random changes. The explanation in Feynman's lectures is very good, an induction argument, but I'll let you look that up yourself. Also, there's a bit more magic here. So far, we've only motivated how things should scale, but perhaps you feel intuitively that the details beyond the scaling will be lost in the randomness. That's pretty much true. The Gaussian central limit theorem applies here in the relevant way. And nothing important goes wrong if we use Gaussian distributed growth factors instead of just two possible growth factors. Don't worry, we'll check by simulation that it all works out, and of course you can do the actual mathematics if you want. So, with all of this, we would have delta x is equal to x times mu delta t plus sigma times a normally distributed random variable with mean zero and variance delta t. The delta t variance here implements the square root of time scaling we wanted for the random bit of the increment. Geometric Brownian motion is simply the continuum limit of this equation. All it means that we imagine the time intervals to become ever smaller and we write the process in analogy to deterministic differential equations as dx is equal to delta x in the limit of delta t going to zero. And we write that as x times mu dt plus sigma dw, where dw is called a Wiener increment, which is normally distributed with mean zero and variance dt. As one might imagine, there are all sorts of pitfalls, and to manipulate and analyze this equation, we do need to learn about them. But the upshot is this. Geometric Brownian motion is the continuous time version of the multiplicative coin toss. And the two parameters, mu and sigma, can be mapped into two corresponding factors for heads and tails. I've done this for the original coin toss, so you can see what it means. The statistical properties of the discrete process and the continuous process converge as we consider longer time scales. The blue line here is the original coin toss game, the orange line is a simulation of the corresponding continuous time geometric ground in motion, and the red line is the expectation value which is the same for both processes. If we play for 10 rounds only, then the difference between discrete and continuous is significant. But if we play for 100 or 1000 or 10,000, then the lines look statistically indistinguishable, and we can even see how the growth rates converge. GBM, and by extension the coin toss, is the fundamental model of any quantity that self-reproduces with random variations meaning it sits somewhere behind all living things and evolution. It's the most important model in mathematical finance. It is also a fantastic model to illustrate key points in ergodicity economics, especially the robust fact that under lifelike random multiplicative dynamics, the mathematical expectation grows at a higher rate than any individual trajectory does in the long run. This is enough for today. I hope you're enjoying these videos. Check out some of the others as we put them online.